Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon to all. My name is Dr. Afifa. I'm one of the emergency physicians from Hospital Sungai Buloh and the topic that I'll be presenting today is on the ventilator waveforms. So these are our learning outcomes. Well, basically, this is a basic ventilation course. So I am not expecting all of you guys to be as amazing as the guy on the left here. Um, what I hope is for you guys, especially for those who are not familiar with the waveforms, that by the end of this lecture, you will be able to know what the basic waveforms are and what they are telling you about. And hopefully, you will also be able to do some simple troubleshooting once you get to know what's normal and what's not. Now, I know some of you are postgraduate trainees and some even emergency physicians probably more senior than I am. So you would probably be expecting more, but I'm afraid I have to emphasize again that this is basic ventilation webinar, so we won't be going too advanced, okay? So briefly, these are the outlines of my presentation. I will be covering a total of five waveforms and tell you what the basic information that we can get from them. Right, first of all, let's talk about the two different types of ventilator graphics, which are your scalar and the loop graphics. Let me have my pointer. Right, so scalars um, provide a basic look at changes in the variables of either pressure, flow or volume against time. So time is always your x-axis, okay? And these can be displayed alone or in combination on the ventilator screen. Um, and usually you will see this as default waveforms seen on the ventilator screen. For example, in your Hamilton, right? Okay, and the second one is the loop graphics. So which can be either your pressure against volume curves like this or your um, flow against volume curve. Right, next, let's talk about the scalar waveforms. Okay, so uh, as already highlighted by Dr. Ikram, you have two different modes here. Okay, so on the left side here, this is what you would expect to see with the volume mode. Okay, um, you can see when your target is the volume. Okay, so the volume is static as compared to the pressure. Usually, the, the flow is in the um, square waveforms um, whereas on the pressure modes here um, you can see that the, the, the pressure is static as the maximum target that you set and the flow is in the descending nature usually and the volume is not much different from the volume modes but it's going to be changing with every breath because it's not what uh, you set as a target as compared to the volume modes. Right, so uh, what information can you get from our very first waveform, which is the pressure against time curve? Okay, so there are extensive lists here, but to start with for beginners, we'll just have a look at the first six listed. I'll go through one by one. So, um, first of all, as I already mentioned before, from the shape, of the uh, pressure against time um, waveform. Um, it's the easiest one that you can use to determine whether the patient is on volume modes or on the pressure modes. Okay, so in volume modes, the shape will be an exponential rise or an accelerating ramp, whereas in pressure modes, the shape will be rectangular or square. This means that the pressure remains constant throughout the breath cycle. Okay, looking at this graph here, you can immediately tell that your patient is on volume mode. Okay, why? Because you, because this is an exponential rise shape. Okay, as compared to the pressure mode, you will have a square form. Okay, so now. Can you imagine that you want to blow up a balloon? Okay, so let's make it let let's make the process tally with this graph here. Okay, the process of blowing up a balloon. 
Okay, so you think about your first breath with the balloon of how strong you have to push to open up the balloon because of the resistance. So until the resistance has passed, then after that, it will become easier for you to blow up into the balloon. Okay? And you can also stop blowing up the balloon and keep the volume. Okay? And after that, you may release the balloon so the air will be coming out of the balloon. Okay? So, this is what happens here. Okay? So, the ventilator... Uh, begins to give breath to the patient so this is where the inspiration begins okay so it needs uh, a lot of pressure to 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 give the volume to the lungs okay until the resistance has passed okay so actually let me have a pen here okay so so if the pressure goes on it will go until if this is the point where where the um the, the resistance has uh, passed okay so it will become easier to uh, blow up the balloon so you don't need you don't need that much pressure okay so it will go almost plateau okay but if you put an inspiratory hold that is if you stop blowing into the balloon so there is no uh, flow in or out from the balloon Okay, so you will get a drop in pressure and then a static pressure. Okay, this is similar to when you uh, put an inspiratory hold. Okay, so this is your P plan. Okay, where there is no flow into and out of the lungs. Okay, and then when you begin expiration here, okay, so the pressure starts to drop. Okay. So this is your PIP, which is your peak inspiratory pressure or your P-peak. And this here is your P-plat when you put an inspiratory hold. Okay, and the area under the entire curve represents the mean airway pressure. Okay, so what can you learn from the pressure against time curve? Okay, let's say you have a ventilated patient and the uh, um, pressure alarm is beeping, okay? So you can have a look at this graph. So let's say this is a normal graph here. Okay, so you have your, you have your, let's have, let's have a pointer. So this is your PIP or P-peak. And this is your P plat, okay, when you put an inspiratory hold. Um, so basically, um, when you see a rise in, let's say the P, PIP is here or your P pitch is here, okay, so you want to know whether the rise is because of the rise in the P plat or is it the rise in the airway pressure. So airway pressure is your P peak minus P plat. Okay, so this is your airway pressure from here to here. Okay, okay, so let's say you have a rise in your P peak. Okay, so you but your P plat is normal. Okay, at the same level here. Okay, so that means your PAW or your airway pressure here is raised. Okay, that is your P peak minus your P plat. Okay, so why is the airway pressure increased? It's because of the airway resistance. So why? These are the differential. So this is how you troubleshoot. Okay, and uh, now let's say you have a high P peak same level here okay but uh, the PAW or your airway pressure here is the same okay so it goes down just until here okay can you see that okay sorry my drawing is very bad okay and then your P plat is here 
Then it goes down. Okay, so it means that your P plate has raised from here to here. Okay, so you have an increasing P plate. That means that you have a problem with the compliance. So your lung has become very bad. Okay, so what is the cause? These are the example of the causes of poor compliance problem and how you want to troubleshoot. Okay. What else can you determine from this waveform? Okay. Um, so first, the baseline increases when the PEEP is added. So if you set PEEP at 5, you can see that it's increased from the baseline like here. Okay. And as per Dr. Sonia's talk, you can determine your driving pressure from here, right? So your driving pressure, which is your P plate minus the P. Okay, so this is your driving pressure. And you don't want it to be more than 15. Right. And secondly, you can also learn if the patient is breathing on their own. If there is a negative deflection, at the beginning of the breath like this, okay, it means that the patient is triggering the breath. Okay, so it's good news if the patient has a CNS problem because you know that the patient is triggering a breath. Okay, but it can also be a sign that patient has not enough sedation if you need deep sedation. So it depends on situation and what you really want to achieve. Okay. Right, I give you another example, okay? So, look at this graph here. You have a negative deflection here. It just means that the patient is uh, triggering the breath, okay? So, the ventilator sensitivity is set um, so that an inspiratory effort by the patient will trigger the delivery of a breath, okay? If you look at the next one here, you don't see a negative pressure, okay? It means that the patient is not triggering the breath, but instead, it is initiated by the machine. So it could be time triggered, for example. Okay, and the last one here just indicates an improperly set sensitivity. So the patient has to generate a large negative inspiratory pressure before the trigger point is reached and the breath is given. Okay, so this will increase the work of breathing of the patient and it's very uncomfortable for them. So how do you correct this? Is you can make the machine more sensitive. Okay. Right. So we finish with our first scalar waveform, which is the pressure against time curve. So I hope after this, just by looking at this graph, you will all be able to tell what mode the patient is on, the PIP, P plat, and PIP value. You can also tell whether the patient is triggering their own breath or whether the patient has um, either airway obstruction or poor lung compliance. Now, let's go to our second waveform, which is the flow against time curve. So, there are two commonly used type of uh, flow patterns available on most ventilators. So, the first one is your square or constant flow pattern. Okay, so you have a square wave here. And usually, you will see this in the volume mode. Okay. So your flow is constant while your pressure is rising up. And another one is your decelerating wave or the ram type pattern, in which you, you, you usually see in pressure modes. Okay. Um, so the flow is reducing as you want to maintain the constant pressure. Let's take a look at one of the flow versus time graphics. Okay, so um, this is your uh, inspiration and this is where your expiration begins. So this is when your ventilator starts giving a breath to the patient and this is when the patient starts breathing out into the ventilator. So what is normal here um, is that the line should touch the baseline before the next before the start of the next breath okay so if the expiratory flow doesn't return to the baseline before the next breath starts so that means that not all the inspired air, air here is returned back to the ventilator so 
So uh, it means some air is still trapped inside the lung. So you call it air trapping or auto pit. Okay. So how do you um how how do you, uh, what what is the cause uh, of this auto pit? Okay. So here are the four causes listed. So you may have inadequate e time or too long i time inspiratory time. Okay. So how do you troubleshoot these two? Okay. So let's say you have a shorter i time or and a longer e time. Okay. So let's say you change the i time from here to here. Okay. So you can see that with the same rate of return to the uh, to the baseline. So actually, it, with the same respiratory rate, the patient will have more time to achieve the uh, to the baseline before the next breath start. Okay, so it will reduce the air trapping. Right. Okay. So how do you change the eye time from here to here? Okay. So first you can. Um, where's my time? Okay, so first you can uh, adjust the setting in the ventilator setting itself. So you reduce the I time here. So re just reduce the I time. Um, and then you can also change the IE. So let's say from 1 to 2. Like here maybe it's 1 to 2. So you change to 1 to 5. So your I time, uh, this, is, this will be your uh, inspiration and this will be your expiration so 1 to 5 so or 1 to 4 okay so 1 2 3 4 and this is 1 okay so this will make your inspiratory time stop here uh, what else can you do is you can increase flow so you increase the flow you don't need that much time to achieve your target volume or you can also reduce the tidal volume okay so your flow is the same but you use less time to achieve your tidal volume because it's reduced okay i hope you are, you you can get that um, and the, the third cause of um of auto pip is it could be because of your uh, rate is too high because when the rate is too high the expiration time gets shortened so what you can do is you can reduce your RR. So when you reduce rate, so instead of, uh, for example, this is 3 seconds from, let me get my pointer. Okay, so for example, this is 3 seconds from here to here. So you can increase the, uh, you can you can reduce the rate. So your, your duration of one breath is increased. And so will your um, expiration time or your e time okay so increasing the rr actually does nothing to your i time here so it will stay here but your next breath will start uh, later on so you will have a longer e time okay but having said that about this uh, this uh, change in rate reducing the rate and reducing the tidal volume although it may help with air trapping but usually we don't really use uh, these uh, measures to improve the auto pit because it will also reduce your minute ventilation okay and um, uh, you have to justify why you want to use it okay and uh, the last cause is uh, because of the prolonged expiration prolonged expiratory time from bronchos bron bronchospasm okay so what you can do is obviously you can use medications to break the bronchospasm right so next you can also determine your bronchodilator response okay remember that this is your expiratory lean um, so this here is actually reflects your uh, peak expiratory flow um, remember the one that you ask patient to glow into the uh, peak flow meter uh, in uh, to, to assess the acute asthma patients okay so this is the same as uh, PEFR okay so it's the peak expiratory flow so to assess response to bronchodilator therapy you should see an increase in the 
peak expiratory flow rate. Okay, so your vertical line here will be longer. So that is a good sign. It means that the patient is responding to your bronchodilator treatment. And some more, if you notice the area of no flow indicated by the red line here, this is known as a zero flow state. This indicates that the eye time is too long for this patient. Okay, so you can reduce the eye time. And you can also see here that the decelerating flow pattern may be preferred over the constant flow pattern. Okay, why? Because you see here the same tidal volume is delivered but with a lower peak pressure. Okay, Dr. Ikram has already mentioned about this so I'm not going to go through this again. Okay, so in summary, for the from the flow against time curve, uh, you can use it to assess the breath type okay so you usually you usually can determine whether it's pressure or volume mode uh, you can check for air trapping and you can also check for bronchodilator response now let's move to our third reform okay which is the volume against time okay i've already told you before that the volume against time um, shape are almost similar in both volume and pressure mode but in pressure mode the highest volume given is going to be changing with every breath because it's not the target as compared to the volume mode it will be static if there is no resistance to the volume given by the ventilator so uh, the, the volume waveform will generally have a mountain peak appearance at the top or it can also uh, have a flattened area at the peak of the waveform. The, uh, this, this can also occur uh, if you put an inspiratory faucet uh, for the patient to check for P plat. Now let's interpret the graph. So now your volume should start at zero. Let's say you have a tidal volume of 450, then this should rise to 450 and then goes back to zero, which means 450 mils of air goes in and 450 mils of air comes out back into the ventilator. So what happens if you see the volume comes up and it doesn't return to the baseline as it's supposed to, like the dotted lines here? It means that you have the loss of volume here. Okay, so the problem can be either air trapping or leaking. Now, here is how you tell the difference. Okay, you look back at your flow waveform. If it doesn't return back to the baseline, uh, then you know it's because of air trapping. Okay, I hope you can answer this. I've already mentioned it just a few slides before. Um, but if you look back at the flow waveform and you see that this goes back to the baseline, I mean it's normal, then this is the result of a leak. Okay, so once you know it's leaking, then you have to find what is causing the leak. Okay, is it a leaking ETT cuff? So you change your ETT. Is it a, is, is, is the air leaking into the pleural cavity? Um, so, uh, as in the, the patient develops pneumothorax, uh, then you have to treat the pneumothorax, okay? Okay, to summarize, you have seen how the volume waveforms can be used to look for autopip or leaks. And, uh, obviously, you know how to decide the tidal volume from the graph. That's quite straightforward. Okay, now we can move on to our loop waveform. So you have your pressure versus volume loop or your flow against volume loop. Okay, so these are the shapes. We we'll go one by one. This is typically a normal shape for pressure volume curve in a mechanically ventilated patient. These graphics indicate a complete one breath. So, um, in, this is where the inspiration is and this is where the expiration is. So the ventilator is giving breath to the patient and the patient is exhaling back into the ventilator. Right, so um, you see the X exists here is the 
pressure. I lost my pointer again. Okay, so this is the pressure. So if you apply a pip, you can see that the the uh, the graph or the loop will move to the right. Okay, so instead of start here, it will start here. Okay, and if you see this here, okay, it's called the fish tail. Some people call it like that. Um, so it means that, that uh, this is an assisted breathing uh, and the patient uh, is producing a negative pressure to trigger the ventilator. Okay, so after that, the ventilator will give the pressure support and hence the complete breath. And then when the inspiration begins here, okay, remember the early resistance of the of blowing up a balloon. Okay, so you can see that there is an increase in pressure. Okay, so the pressure increase, but there is not much volume change. Only a small volume is given. So until to this point, then very little pressure is needed to cause a uh, high volume change. Okay, so this point here is what you call as lower inflection point or your critical opening point. Or it, it means that your alveoli has opened up. Okay, so ideally, uh, we can uh, set our pit at this level. Uh, that will be the optimal pit because we hold the alve alveoli open ready to receive that amount of volume more easily okay so um, if you go up here okay this actually looks normal but if it shows something like this this is what you call as bird beak or beaking okay and um, um, so uh, it means that the pressure continues to rise with little or no change in volume. So you can imagine you are over distending the lungs or the alveoli that may raise the patient with barotrauma. So you really need to fix this. How do you want to fix this? Is that you can reduce the tidal volume. Maybe you set the tidal volume too high, for example. Maybe you set 700. So the ventilator is trying to give so much pressure to achieve that tidal volume. But actually... You are causing the barotrauma. Okay, so if you go down here, this is the um, critical closing pressure. Okay, Cri critical closing pressure, the point where alveoli is starting to close, so you get a big drop in the pressure. Okay, what can you determine from this pressure volume loop? So as airway resistance increase, the loop will become wider. An increase in the expiratory resistance is usually more commonly seen, for example, in asthma. Uh, An inspiratory uh, resistance can increase usually from a kink ETT or patient biting. Okay. Um, uh, so you see this is a normal shape, but if it gets wider, this means that the patient has airway resistance. Right, and next one, uh, the, the graph can also show whether uh, there is an increased compliance if the, the loop uh, sh is shifted upward to the left side or uh, it can show a decreased compliance, uh, for example, ARDS, if the loop uh, actually goes further down to the right from the normal. Okay. So this is your normal, this is shifted up and this is shifted down to the right side. Right, so the expiratory, you can see here, the, the inspiratory portion is fine, but the expiratory portion of the loop doesn't return to the baseline. So this indicates a leaking. Okay. So in summary, you can use the pressure volume loop to assess uh, the triggering effort. Remember your fish tail, uh, you can also assess the compliance, the lung over distension, the leaking, the airway obstruction. Uh, remember that the, the, the loop becomes wider and as well as your 
bronchodilator response if you can uh, make sense out of it. So it gets wider with airway obstruction obviously. With the uh, bronchodilator, you would expect to see a nar narrowing of the uh, wider loop. Okay. Finally, we come to our last waveform which is the flow volume curve. I hope you are still with me. Okay. So uh, let's have a look quickly. So this is a normal shape. This is where uh, the start of inspiration is. So this is your inspiration part. And this is the start of your expiration. You breathe out into the ventilator and then it goes back to the baseline and start another cycle of breath. Okay, so this completes the cycle of breath. Now, the flow volume loops used for ventilator graphics are the same as ones used for pulmonary function testing. That is when you do the spirometry, if you can recall, uh, only that it's upside down. Okay, so this is your uh, graph when you do a uh, spirometry, mm, but it's upside down in the ventilator graphics. Okay, so um, if this is your PEFR in your spirometry, then here is the PEFR in the uh, flow volume loop. So from this, we know that we can assess the bronchodilator response as well. So it will go down further as your PFR improves with the bronchodilator. Just so you know, when I say that this shape is normal, this shape can also be normal. So basically, uh, the shape on the inspiratory limb here, it will match what is set on the ventilator. As mentioned before, the square flow seen more often in volume modes, whereas the decelerating pattern is usually what you see in pressure mode. So you get a loop, uh, a flow volume loop like this. Right, so what can you learn from the flow volume curve? Um, first of all, you can determine whether there is an airway obstruction. Remember your spirometry, that's what it's used for. Um, so what, uh, so if, if you have a scoop like here in your expiratory limb of your loop, what this tells you is that your patient has some sort of obstruction. So what you have to do is to figure out what's causing the obstruction. This could be anything from secretion, so you do suctioning, or bronchospasm, so you can give them bronchodilators, or patients may be biting the tube, so you have to increase the sedation, or it could be just a disease process, for example, emphysema, which you can't really do anything about it, unfortunately. Now, let us recall back the volume time curve. So this uh, is a loss of volume and it could mean either leaking or air trapping. So which one is it? Your flow volume curve will also help you to determine which one is it. Okay, so if there's a leak, this is what the uh, loop would look like. Okay, so it, it will return to the baseline earlier. But it, it, if it is air trapping, Okay, so your expiration uh, curve will look like this, okay, um, because it won't return back to the baseline as the air is kept inside. Okay, so it means that you don't exhale all that you received. And another abnormality is if you notice a sort of appearance in your flow volume curve like this. This can either mean that the patient has excessive secretion, okay, water from the uh, ventilator tubing, or it could be because of turbulence from bronchospasm. Now, if you saw the sort of appearance is on the inspiratory limb, then you can tell that the condensation is in your inspiratory limb. So the last summary, what you can determine from your flow volume loop is that you can use it to assess the air trapping, the airway obstruction, the bronchodilator response, 
leaking and um, water or secretion accumulation. So there you go, we've discussed all the five A farms and I hope you do learn something from the lecture and be able to put it into practice. Uh, with that, I thank you for listening. Any questions you can post in the chat box on your right side. Thank you very much.